okay, thank you very much. Uh, really happy to be uh, yeah, here in the conference. Um, my name is William Lopez. Um, this is part of my work of my master thesis that uh, I did together with uh, Afghanis Mirnov as my thesis supervisor. And it's uh, named Shapley Value Inductive Conformal Prediction. Uh, first, uh, to talk about the motivation of why uh, to do this. Uh, recently, there was the a proposed use of Shapley values, which are a game theoretical concept for the problem of data valuation. And in this case, uh, these data Shapley values are defined as the marginal contribution of a data instance in a training set to the performance of a classifier on a validation set given a chosen performance metric. Uh, these Shapley values will give a score for a many label instance. And this score will gonna be high if the instance contribute to the positive performance of the classifier, or it's gonna be negative if it doesn't. Um, also, we uh, take into account uh, some current limitations of uh, conformity functions used in the conformal uh, framework, which are mostly uh, based on the on point classifiers. So either on their nature or on their output as uh, scoring classifiers, but we don't really have a specific influence on the performance metric that we need uh, or we use for our task on the conformity scores themselves. Then the next step was uh, really to explore the use uh, or propose the use of these new data Shapley values for data evaluation as uh, conformity scores inside the, the conformity, the conformal framework. So we can have conformity scores that uh, will allow us to encode the conformity with respect to different performance metrics and depending on the task that we have at hand. Um, as just to a brief overview of the inductive conformal predictor uh, setting, let's say, uh, we start defining our data. We uh, split it into a training set and, and a calibration or validation set. We then normally commonly uh, train a point classifier on the training set and either because of its nature or of its output as a scoring classifier, uh, we use it as a conformity function. And we use this conformity function to compute conformity scores for all, all the instances in the validation set. And then when a new, uh, when a new test instance comes, we, uh, for any class that the uh, test instance can uh, have, we compute conformity scores. And then uh, we compute the p-values, uh, which the p-value for uh, class Y for any test instance, let's say X, is defined as the fraction of instances in the validation set uh, that are equal or less conforming than the test instance. And finally, we just include that uh, class Y in the prediction set if the p-value of that class is uh, greater than a significance level that we choose. To talk about a bit about the Shapley values, uh, they're a concept in co cooperative game theory, uh, and they aim to give a unique reward uh, allocation for all the players involved in a cooperative game. In our setting uh, for data evaluation, the players are the data instances in a training set. Uh, the goal is the correct classification of the instances in the validation set using a classifier H. And we use a characteristic function that would determine uh, the performance of the of the players given the goal, and in our case, it's going to be the performance metric that we choose. So it could be accuracy, uh, rock area under curve, uh, F1 score. So in this sense, the Shapley value of, um, for data evaluation in this case is essentially just the average marginal contribution of a training instance for the performance of a predictor uh, established by the characteristic function that we choose. Uh, when trained over all possible subsets of the training set. I will come back to this in a bit. These Shapley values have many properties that we find uh, interesting and valuable for, uh, for our approach. Uh, we have group rationality. So we say that the reward or the Shapley value is completely distributed among all the players. Fairness, uh, same contribution, uh, two instances with the same contribution will have the same Shapley value. Dummy player means that if a data instance has no contribution to the performance, it will have zero Shapley value. Um, and the most important, let's say, it's the additivity property, 
that we're going to use a lot uh, is uh, defined as, let's say, if we have a main task uh, that is comprised of many subtasks, the contribution of a player to the main task is equal to the sum of the contribution of the subtasks belonging to the uh, main task, right? Um, yeah, as I mentioned uh, before, the we have to calculate to get a proper Sharpie value for any data instance, we have to calculate all permutations or subsets of the players, in this case, the, the training set. And that makes it uh, quite difficult to uh, compute efficiently because we have, uh, yeah, have exponential complexity to find all the possible permutations. To address this uh, kind of limitation, uh, some authors uh, let's say recently, rather recently, uh, proposed a, an approximate uh, algorithm to get approximate Sharpie values for data evaluation, and it's called truncated Monte Carlo Sharpie. So they use a truncated Monte Carlo approach to get these Sharpie values. Uh, as a quick overview, they just use a random permutation from start to finish in the uh, Monte Carlo uh, scheme. They add a data point to get the contribution as a Monte Carlo sample. They use Monte Carlo approximation scheme to obtain the average contribution of that sample. And then they use uh, truncation to stop sampling once the performance is between a predefined tolerance. So they don't explore all the possible subsets. But this uh, approach allows us to use any classifier that we want, uh, and then we can use any performance metric. However, they are approximate Shapley values for the data uh, valuation problem. Um, some time later, uh, some other authors uh, propose the exact computation of the Shapley values with an algorithm uh, for a specific for the problem uh, for the subset of nearest neighbor, let's say models. But in this case, we're going to call it ESBNN. And they just uh, use the distance structure of the feature space of the data to, uh, or they leverage this uh, fact to just do one pass over the data so they don't compute all possible permutations. Um, and they sort, uh, well, the, the main idea overall is to, they sort the training instances according to each validation instance. And they use a recursive rule to uh, compute all the Shapley values for all training instances. And finally, they use the additivity property to average the, Shap the Shapley value with respect to all validation instances. Um, this approach is, um, of course, by, uh, used only for uh, nearest neighbor classification. It's mostly related to accuracy, but the yeah, the good thing about it is that we have exact Shapley values, and that it's uh, computationally really efficient, much more efficient even than the truncated Monte Carlo one, because we only have to do one pass over the whole data set. Now we can uh, talk about our main contribution. So the first uh, will be uh, the proposal of use this data Shapley values as conformity scores, as a model agnostic scheme, and then how to implement those uh, Shapley values to construct inductive conformal predictors. Um, first, um, talking about Shapley values, uh, we can see that they encode the contribution of any instance to the performance of a classifier for a classification task given a validation set. And this contribution can be positive, of course, if the instance conforms to the data distribution and supports the optimal decision boundary established by the classifier. Or if it doesn't, uh, it will be a negative uh, Shapley value because it's not supporting that um, um, decision, optimal decision boundary found by the classifier. So in this, uh, Slide, uh, we see some Shapley values obtained using the truncated Monte Carlo approach, which are approximate Shapley values. On the left, uh, we see uh, this data distribution of two classes, perfectly balanced data. But we can see that uh, depending on the uh, classifier that we pick, we will get um, different Shapley values for the same data, uh, for the same data in the training set. Um, we roughly observe that the closer uh, that the instances that are closer to the class borders, let's say, tend to have a lower Shapley value than the instances that are closer to the class centers. And then similarly, the, the instances that are surrounded by instances uh, of the opposite class receive a lowest, uh, lower Shapley value. 
On the right hand side, uh, we have still uh, again uh, just a data distribution, two classes, but in this case, we have highly uh, unbalanced data set. And then we can see that for just uh, using the same classifier, but changing our characteristic function or uh, yeah, our metric, right? We will obtain different Shapley values. Um, in this case, we have accuracy, F1 score, and rock area under curve. And if you see, for example, uh, in accuracy, uh, most of the positive Shapley values go to the majority class because that will probably give you a, pro, a high accuracy on the on the problem on the task. But when we start to use uh, F1 score or rock area under curve, we see that the Shapley values change completely. Uh, and then they start to be more focused on the minority class because that's the class of interest for the task that we need. Um, and then we have, uh, let's say, more, a bit more defined uh, decision boundaries. Um, when we compare the, the exact uh, algorithm that I just described for KNN with the truncated Monte Carlo one, uh, for the same um, examples I presented before, balanced and unbalanced data, we see that the exact value uh, here called ESBNN, the exact Shapley values are much more defined than the truncated approximated ones. Uh, and they're more defined for uh, balanced data or unbalanced data. And this is why uh, for this particular paper, we will focus on using this exact algorithm to compute them, uh, yeah, to explore their, their possibilities, uh, but it is important always to remember that these Shapley values can be computed for any point classifier using any uh, performance metric that uh, we need for the task. So our first uh, approach, let's say, uh, it's to uh, implement the Shapley value-based inductive conformal predictor using the nearest neighbor uh, based Shapley algorithm that I just uh, described. The, in essence, is pretty similar to an inductive conformal predictor. So we still are going to split the data set into a training set and a validation set or calibration, as you may call it. Um, but we are going to use this uh, exact algorithm for Shapley values uh, to get the Shapley values, and we are going to use them as conformity scores. So when a new test instance comes, uh, we're going to compute this Shapley value of the test instance with respect to the validation set or calibration set. And based on these um, conformity scores, um, we're going to calculate the p-values for each of the classes. And we're still going to uh, include the prediction, the class in the prediction set if it's above a uh, significance level. So in, the, in this sense, it's not really that different. The main difference is that this sharply based approach, let's say, can be thought as partially transductive uh, in the sense that it recomputes the sharply values, in this case, the conformity scores, for any new test instance. So every time a new test instance comes, we need to recompute all the sharply values uh, with the for the training instances as well. Uh, and this is due to the fact that uh, yeah, the existing algorithms that we are uh, that we have at hand are batch, so they need to recompute every time uh, all the Shapley values, every time the data changes. However, the previous approach, uh, even though it's pretty straightforward, uh, it's a kind of a global approach in, uh, in a sense, because we are computing Shapley values for any training instance uh, with respect to all the validation instances in the validation set. So it could happen that uh, a training instance that belongs to a relatively small uh, but important cluster of a, or a class uh, could receive a relatively low Shapley value. So we, what we also propose, which is let's say an, uh, another contribution, is to reintroduce the locality of the nearest neighbor algorithm on which this uh, exact computation of Shapley values is based. And and we use it by introducing a parameter L to take into account that locality. The, the same principles apply for, uh, for the local version of, of our new proposed algorithm. 
the only difference is that uh, for uh, well, I mean we're gonna only compute the Shapley values only for the instances that are in the L neighborhood of the validation instance. And then again, we're just again gonna use this additivity property to average all the Shapley values uh, with respect to the L neighborhood of the validation instances. Mm. We are aware, of course, that since we are uh, limiting the computation of the Shapley values to the L neighborhood of the validation instances specifically, if a training instance is a complete outlier, so it's not really in the L neighborhood of any validation instance, uh, we will, let's say, give it a non value. And this L parameter that we propose can be chosen by the user without any restriction, but we have explored, uh, let's say, its allocation as a percentage of the training set size. So it could be 50% or 30%. Um, yep. And then uh, here in this plot, we can see the global Shapley values uh, obtained by the exact global algorithm and the local ones uh, with the introduction of the locality. In this case, the locality is half of the training uh, set. Yeah, we can see, I mean, both uh, charts are in the same range, so they, uh, the colors get kind of squished um, a bit. But the, the main idea is that uh, the cho this choice of the locality parameter provides a higher range of Shapley values, meaning that what was uh, a low Shapley value in the global version will become even lower using the local version and conversely the, the, the opposite. So if, if it was high, it will become higher now. And this is something that uh, our intuition, uh, I mean, we, we desire because we, if you have an increased range, uh, that creates a better allocation of the Shapley values for all the training instances. And then we could have uh, a bigger difference between the conforming and non-conforming instances for the same training set. Uh, even though the two, algorithms that I described, let's say uh, the global version of the, the um, algorithm that creates a global sharply inductive conformal predictor and the local version that follow the same principles but uses the local uh, algorithm are inductive conformal predictors. We have to note that they use the validation or calibration set in an opposite way to the traditional standard inductive conformal predictor. So while the inductive conformal predictor will, um, for any new test instance, in this case, visualize as this uh, orange block, um, will compute the conformity scores on the calibration set with, uh, of course, the, the test instance, and you will use them to uh, obtain the p-values. Our sharply uh, inductive conformal predictor will calculate the conformity of the new training instance, but along with the training set instances with uh, respect of the performance of a classifier on, a, on the validation or calibration set. So they still split the data set, but they use it in opposite or complementary ways, let's say. So this is something important to take into account. Uh, now we can continue to the experimental settings and our results. We evaluated the two new uh, inductive, sharply based inductive conformal predictors on many data sets, mainly from the, uh, all of them from the UCI machine learning repository. We pick uh, data sets with different amount of instances uh, different cardinalities, uh, uh, two class problems or multi class problems, and different uh, class um, valences. <clears throat> and the experimental settings uh, we used first, uh, we used five fold cross validation to evaluate our, our results. As a baseline, we used uh, a standard ICP model that uses a KNN. Uh, as an underlying model and the conformity score we use in this case was the probability estimate of uh, let's say a given class, a class given a specific instance. 
our global Shapley inductive conformal predictor uses the exact uh, algorithm for nearest neighbor uh, Shapley values. The local, we, yeah, the local Shapley inductive conformal predictor uses the local version that we proposed with this locality parameter. They both uh, follow the same principles and the same operation. We just change the, algor the algorithm to compute the Shapley values. Uh, three, the three models are, of course, based on k nearest neighbors. So they used uh, the same uh, number of nearest neighbors for the same k <clears throat> is maintained always for the three of them. And we, yeah, given what I explained before uh, of, on how these uh, two approaches use the data split in a different way, we evaluate them on different data splits. So the first data split will be 50% for training and 50 for validation. The other data split will be 33 for training and 67 for validation. And the other one will be the opposite, 67 for training and 33 for validation, 33%. Our performance metrics that we, that we used were uh, first the rate of empty sets, the rate of single sets and their error, the rate of multiple sets and their error the total error rate, uh, the S criteria, or the sum of, let's say, uh, p-values, the average sum of the p-values, the N criterion, which is the average size of the prediction set. Uh, in this uh, presentation, and mainly on the paper, we uh, focus to uh, show the ionosphere data set uh, from the UCI uh, machine learning repository. We chose it because it's a relatively difficult data set uh, in a 34 dimensional space and it has non linearly separable classes. Uh, here in this slide, you can see on the top left uh, the three predictors, let's say the baseline and the new Shapley ones are valid. Uh, however, the ICP is conservatively valid, uh, while the Shapley versions global and local are yeah, almost exactly valid except for some statistical fluctuations. Um, and this is something really uh, interesting to note, given that uh, we are not using p-value smoothing for any of the three classifiers. On the right, uh, for example, we see the rate of single sets and below it, we see the error on those single sets for different significance levels. Um, and they show that the local uh, Shapley inductive conformal predictor and the global version have higher rate of single sets and lower error on those single sets than the ICP baseline, especially for uh, significance level less than 0 0.2. On the bottom left, uh, we see the rate of multiple sets, where we also see that um, the sharply based inductive conformal predictors, both uh, in the lower uh, significance levels, give less multiple uh, sets. And more specifically, the local version of uh, the algorithm when compared to the global one, in all the metrics showed here and overall in all of them, uh, outperforms the, the global version, mostly when the data is. It's really it's highly clustered. When we go a bit more, yeah? For four minutes. OK, good. I'm close to finish. So the when we focus on significance levels 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0 0.1 that are uh, important significance level for critical applications uh, or where these conformal uh, predictors are normally used, we see that they are all valid. That's uh, important. Um, the rates of empty prediction sets uh, for the uh, baseline is lower than the than the Shapley value ones. The rate of single prediction set of the Shapley uh, ICPs are usually higher than those of the baseline. The rates of multiple prediction sets for Shapley based inductive conformal predictors is uh, usually lower than the baseline. And the rate uh, of empty prediction sets for ICP are lower. As I mentioned, um, yeah, and then we can see that the local, uh, the global version and the local version are more informationally efficient than the ICP baseline, giving 
more single sets with less error on these uh, low uh, significance levels. And particularly, the local version is even more uh, informationally efficient than the global version for cluster data, as I mentioned before. These uh, results, even though we show them for INOS for data set, are consistent in uh, yeah, most of the data sets for uh, all the significance levels. Uh, as a concluding remarks, uh, we can say that our proposed Shapley value scheme to construct non-conformity function has two main advantages. Again, it's a general scheme, so we can apply to any type of point uh, predictors. And uh, also, more importantly, it allows to compute in conformity scores with respect to different aspects of the classification task, uh, focusing on different performance metrics. Our presented global and local uh, Shapley inductive conformal predictors are valid and informationally efficient conformal predictors. And on the experimental data, the global and local versions are better than the ICP baseline. And the local version that we now uh, uh, propose is more informationally efficient than the global one. As a future research, uh, we will focus on uh, maybe developing incremental and kernel based Shapley value algorithms that will help us speeding up. Uh, the computation of the conformity scores. And given the complementary way on which this baseline and the Shapley methods use the validation set, we will focus also in uh, a combination of the two. And that's, uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, 